How we doing tonight, Anchor? Y'all, listen. If it's your first time here, I'm telling you, it's going to be a fiery night. I had to go home in between the first two services and tonight, changed my shirt. Jim, I was sweating like crazy. Man, it's going to be a good night. And if it's your first time here, welcome. And um, if it is your first time here, we're so glad. We're so glad on a Sunday night when there's lots of stuff happening in South Florida that you are here with us. And if you are new to Anchor Church, um, we're family. And when you're not here, we're just not the same. And, you know, I... Um, I am a, I'm a hugger. I love to hug people. And so when COVID was happening, oh my gosh, it was like the worst thing in the world because I just, you know, like instinct is to hug people. And so I hug people. They'd be like, oh. And then Teresa would yell at me. I'm like, I'm, I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, so now I'm like, if you feel comfortable. And I even asked somebody when they came in today, I say, hey, can I, can I hug you? They're like, absolutely. Because I had a, a friend years ago that said, hey, you haven't done that hugging thing for a while on Sundays. And I said, oh, I forgot about that. My, my, my bad. And uh, they said, well, that's the only time all week I get a hug, and I look forward to it every week. And I said, I don't want to miss that, man. I don't want to miss that. But we're so glad you're with us. And, and um, I'm going to jump in in just a second, but uh, I didn't share this announcement uh, today, baby. But uh, the last Sunday night of June, the last Sunday night of July, and the last Sunday night of August, we're doing our anchor worship nights and um it's going to be pretty incredible and the 20 i think it's the 26th am i right june 27th that sunday night uh we'll have two services that night we'll have a six and an eight uh because and that will happen just on the nights that we do the worship nights the summer worship nights we have uh guest artists coming in for those nights and it's going to be it's going to be a fun time. We have uh, the 27th that Sunday night. We have new Anchor Church merch coming out. So it's it's going to be a great night. You don't want to miss that. But six and eight, and it, it'll be it'll be fun. But I, can I can, I want to jump in? Can I just jump in? I want to I want to pre. I just want to go. I want to go for it. This is uh, week two of our series. I'll build it. And the, what we're doing is we're walking through the book of Nehemiah. And the importance of this series is that you and I would say it's not somebody else's responsibility to build the church. It's my responsibility. I'll, I'll take ownership and I will do it because the church is not a building, as Marco was saying earlier. The church is people and we're building church together, us together. It's not just like, Sean, you do your part. That's what we pay you for. No, it's us together building church together because if the church is united, it's amazing what God can accomplish. And the devil is not afraid of a big church. The devil is scared to death of a united church. And it's amazing what the church can do when we're united together. And this has been our, our theme verse for this, this series as we go through the book of Nehemiah. It comes from the New Testament, book of Ephesians chapter 4. The apostle Paul says this. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up. Somebody say build up. Yeah. Notice our job is not to tear down the church. A lot of churches tearing down the church. It's not our job to tear down the church. It's our job to build up the church. It's not our job to tell somebody else how to build the church. It's our job to build the church. It's not our job to talk about building the church. It's our job to build the church. And Paul says this, and this will continue. Somebody say, this will continue. People say, Sean, when will Anchor Church stop growing? As long as people are going to hell, we will continue to build the church. It never stops. We will continue until all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to a full and complete standard of Christ. It will continue. Now, here's what's difficult. Has anyone else ever noticed that while you're building, it's really difficult to see how far you've actually come? Anyone ever get in the middle of a diet and look in the mirror and go, I've seen no progress? And typically what you do is you go, I'm just going back to the Krispy Kreme because this ain't working. You know what I'm talking about? But, but the problem is, what I notice is this. It's that time in life when you're about three seconds away from a breakthrough that you give up. And if you would have hung on those three extra seconds, you might have been the seen the breakthrough you didn't know was coming. But what happens is it because in the middle of building, in the middle of going, in the middle of walking, in the middle of processing, you can't actually see how far you've come, which means you gotta stop and get perspective every now and then and go, wow. 
which is, I don't know if you've ever seen me before during worship, but I'll turn around a lot and look, because we, we started with 20 people in a little community room. And it's amazing, during a pandemic, we've been in five different locations, and we've grown to three services, and I'll look over my shoulder every single service and go, wow, God, this is how great you are. Because I want to remind myself of the progress. And if you look in the Old Testament, you know what God did? He always had the Israelites build an altar. Do you know why? To remind themselves of how far they come. Because like you and me, we're forgetful people. But you always got to look back and see how far you've progressed because otherwise you'll forget. You know, uh, several years ago, I got invited to go to, to London uh, to a conference, and Teresa couldn't go with me. The kids were smaller then, and so Mike Griffin, uh, he's, he's one of our elders. He started the church with us. I said, I said, Mike, why don't you go with me to, to London, man? We'll go to London together. So I love going to, to places, to, to cities, or to countries where you can walk. I like going to New York because you walk everywhere. I like going to London because you walk everywhere, because where we live here, we drive everywhere. I love being in places where you can walk. So we're in London, and, and I walk, I got long legs. I, mean, I, got, I got a bad ankle right now, but I, I, I like to take long strides. I like to walk fast. And, and, and Mike and I were walking. We walked about a mile. And, and Mike said, hey, pastor, I'm going to really need to, to, like, we need to get an Uber. Because I'm tired of walking, pastor. And I said, man, you know what? Let's just, let's just keep walking a little bit longer. And I, I looked down. I said, do you see that next street down there? He says, yeah. I said, let's walk to that next street. And when we get to that street, then we'll call an Uber. He goes, okay. And I, I knew, like, you ever have those moments where you know someone's getting mad at you, but they love you, but you can kind of see it, you know what I mean? So I knew he was getting kind of ticked. And so I said, let's just go down to that street right there, and then we'll, we'll get an Uber. So we get to the end of the street. He says, can we call an Uber now? I said, man, you know what? The other street right over there is so close. <laughs> let's just walk a little. And so we get to that street. He's like, you want to call an Uber now? I said, man, we're, let's just go one more. This is such a nice day. And we walk two more streets. And then he goes, can we call an Uber? And I said, you know what? Our hotel is so close now. We just might as well walk to our hotel. Because, I mean, you want to get an Uber now and you want to pay like 36 cents to go to the hotel? Let's just keep walking, bro. <laughs> and he was so ticked at me. It's the only time I think in my life Mike's ever been ticked. And we get back to the hotel room that night. We're sitting down and Mike goes, he pulls up his phone. He pulls up the maps. He goes, do you know how far we walked today? I said, no. He goes, 10 miles. I said, you say that like it's a negative thing. I would have said it like, bro, do you know how far we walked today? 10 miles. Like, that's incredible. That's amazing. You know, and then he was so mad at me, he turned the air conditioning on that night to 62 degrees, and I froze to death and got a cold, <laughs> which is another sermon. It's don't mess with the anointed. But anyway, so, but, 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 but Mike goes, can you believe how far we went? And what was so funny was, I didn't recognize how far we actually went until we looked that night to see how far we went. And as a church, it's interesting in a year and a half for us as a church, we forget how far we've come unless you just stop for a minute and pause and go, wow. This is not because we're that good. It's because God is that great. But you've got to look back and you've got to process. Why? Because the building always has to continue. It always does. And if you look at the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah didn't walk away from building the wall around Jerusalem until it was finished. And many of us, if I'm honest, in our lives, we've quit at something halfway through. And we've never seen the benefits of it in our job, in our marriage, in a relationship, because we quit when the going got tough. And what we need to do is continue through that. And if you missed last week as we walked through this book in Nehemiah, basically what happened is this. It's a great book in the Old Testament. If you want to read a great, quick, awesome read, it's the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is working in Babylon for the king of Babylon, and he is a cupbearer to the king. What his job was, was to pour wine for the king. And what was happening was the Israelites were, were captive in Babylon for decades. And then they get released, and many of them go back to Israel. But when they get back to Israel, the wall around the city of God had been broken down. It had been busted down. And because of that, they had many people that were coming in through the broken down wall that used to give protection that didn't give protection anymore. And they were killing Israelites, raping Israelites, taking them captive, moving into slavery. All this kind of stuff was happening because the wall was broken down. And word gets to Nehemiah that the wall is torn down. And Nehemiah says to the king, I've got to go back and help my people. I'll 
build it. I'm not going to wait for it to get done. I've got to go back and help my people. And the king says, you got my blessing. Go do it. Now, this is the the lesson I want to give us today because this is the spiritual key perspective I think I want you to grasp out of this sermon today. When God calls you to build up, the devil will always come to tear down. When God calls you to build up, the devil will always, always come to tear you down. I talk to people all the time when they come to church and they give their heart to Christ and they come forward and they're smiling. They're going, I'm so excited. I gave my heart to Christ. Pastor, any words of wisdom? I said, yes, expect the worst week of your life. Thank you, Pastor, for the encouragement. But I think many of us, we give our hearts to Christ and we think I'll have a full bank account. My zits will be cleared up. I'll have a date next week. Like We just think all these things will happen. But if I'm honest, the devil has lost you forever and he will do everything in his power to make you feel like you made the bad decision of a lifetime. He's coming after you. And immediately, as soon as Nehemiah starts building the wall with the people, guess what happened? The attack starts coming. And this is what it says in Nehemiah chapter 2. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us, somebody say let us. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Why is it so important that Nehemiah didn't say, hey, I'm going to build the wall. If you want to jump in, jump in. He said, let us build the wall. You know why? Because you don't appreciate what you don't invest in. Do you know what I'm talking about? I talk all the time about the importance of tithing to church. Why? Because anchor needs my money? No, because God wants your heart. Because you appreciate what you're invested in. And if you're not invested in the church, then you don't appreciate the church. If you're not invested in the church, then you don't take the church seriously. You take the church for granted. It's important to be invested in. And then you begin to appreciate. And Nehemiah says, I'm not going to build the wall because then you won't appreciate it. Let us build the wall together so you grasp and understand the protection it gives. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. But notice they began the good work. But isn't it just the way things go when you begin to do something great for God? The devil comes in and tries to thwart your plans. But when Sambalot, Tobiah, And Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan. They scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked? I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you have no share, legal, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. What was Nehemiah saying? Nehemiah says, the vision of God is so big on my life, I won't let your negative voices pull me away. And so many of us, so many times, get this big vision from God, and we allow the big vision of God sometimes to be overshadowed by the small negative voices around us. And Nehemiah says, nothing's going to stop what God has started. I told you when we started our church six months in, COVID hit. And as a pastor, if I'm completely honest, I was a man of faith, but I had that human side in me going, what in the world are we going to do? And God spoke to my heart and said, Sean, Anchor Church is unstoppable. And I knew when I got that word, nothing will stop us. And then Nehemiah goes on to say this. Sambalot was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. And and he flew into rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and and the uh, Sumerian uh, army officers, well, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can actually rebuild the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something out of, from stone, from a, from a, a rubble, rubbish heap? I mean, the charred ones at that. I mean, Tobiah the Ammonite, he was standing beside him. He goes, well, this stone is like, it's going to collapse if a fox walks on it. And then I prayed, hear us, O God, for we're being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. I love it. I said, man, Nehemiah, he's savage. 
Yeah, Nehemiah gets bold. He's like, God, don't forgive him. Just strike him dead. I'm like, I'm not saying we should do that. I'm just saying that's what Nehemiah did. Why? Because Nehemiah knew he had the power of God behind him. And listen, I want you to understand. Every single time you choose to say, I'll build it for the kingdom of God. If you said today, I'm gonna, I want to be a part of what God is doing here at Anchor, and I'll build it. When you say, I'll build it, I want you to understand you need to always expect a battle. The minute you say, I'll build it for God, the minute you say, I'm all in for God, you can always expect a battle. Look what it says, Nehemiah 4. But when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdites and the Termites, they heard that the work was, <laughs> the work was going, it says that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. What does that mean? When the gaps of the wall, there were the wall had gaps in it, and that's how they were getting in to infiltrate the Israelites. And so what happened was the gaps in the wall were being sealed up first by Nehemiah so they couldn't get through anymore to attack. And that made Tobias and Sambalot irritated. You know why? Because they couldn't sneak through anymore. And do you know what the devil is so ticked about when you get your heart to Christ? He can't sneak into the cracks of your heart anymore to destroy your soul. Because that's how the devil comes in. You know that, right? He, you know what the Bible says? He, he prowls around waiting for a gap in your heart to sneak in and destroy you. But what Jesus comes to do is to repair the gaps in your heart. Do you know what the Bible says? That Jesus wants to make his home in your heart. So the minute he moves in, he's not living in a heart with gaps. The minute he comes in, he begins to fix the gaps in your heart so the devil can't come in and corrupt anymore. When Teresa and I bought the house we're living in right now, when we looked at the house, the house is beautiful. They had uh, pictures hanging up everywhere and mirrors, and we're like, man, what a beautiful house. And then when we moved into the house, the house was completely empty, and we moved in, and there was giant holes in the walls. Looked like someone took a sledgehammer and put it through the wall. Tons of them. And we have somebody come in and fix the holes in the wall. Do you know why? Because I'm not going to live in a house with big holes in it. So why in the world, when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, would he come and live inside of you and live in a heart with giant holes in it? The first thing he does is repair the holes in your heart. Why? Because he wants to bring corruption, but he can't. And then the Bible says, then they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw them into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Where the devil can't bring corruption, he'll bring confusion. He wants to confuse you. He wants to make you feel like what you're doing right now is too hard. The work you're doing right now is too hard. He wants to make you feel like the harsh pain before is better than the hard work now. Oh, I just, if I went back to that addiction or that old relationship, I went back to the old job. If I just went back, it was much easier. So you think. Because he'll confuse you to make you think that was better but it wasn't better. That was worse. You just forgot. And he confuses you to make you think, oh, I was way better back then. Actually, you weren't. And then it says, and the people of Judah begin to complain. The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Where the devil can't corrupt, where the devil can't confuse, the devil will make you start complaining. Do you know what happens mostly in the church where the devil can't corrupt and the devil can't confuse? He'll make us complain. That anchor church, I can't, they pulled me off a ministry team. I can't believe those sons of guns. I was so talented. I, they, if they would have heard me sing, I'm God's gift to worship. And if I just, they, no, maybe what happened was you were a greater gift in another area of ministry. So God actually spared you and called you up to your potential somewhere else. And it wasn't our fault. God was just trying to use you in another area. But because we don't get what we want, we complain about what we don't have as opposed to being grateful for what we do. 
and we complain and point the fingers, and the devil starts working. Because if he can't corrupt, if he can't confuse, he'll make you complain. And I want to tell you this right now. You have to expect a battle from the outside, but you got to expect a battle from the inside. Because as soon as you give your heart to Jesus Christ, the battle amongst your family is coming fierce. Because what people don't understand, they will undermine. Happens all the time. I just don't understand why you'd serve at church all the time. Why would you give your money to church? Why would you? I don't understand why. Because what you don't understand, you undermine. You make them think it's not that big. It's just, it's crazy how it happens. But the attacks come. How many people have you talked to that gave their heart to Jesus Christ? And as soon as they begin giving their heart to Christ, walking with Christ, building at the church, tithing at the church, serving at the church, every time that happens, they start having family issues. Because the devil knows he can attack the family first and get you. And that's where he wants to attack us. He wants to attack us at the family. So the battle's coming from the outside, but the battle's coming from the inside. And you and I have to understand that when the battle comes, the build will always seem useless. Always. It will always feel like what you're doing doesn't make sense because the devil's trying to make you think it doesn't make sense. When you say, I'll build it, you have to always expect a battle. But when you say, I'll build it, you have to always stay battle ready. It's not a matter of if the battle from the devil's coming. It's a matter of when it's coming. I mean, did anybody know this to be true? You're either coming out of a battle, going into a battle, or you're right in the middle of a battle. Can I get a witness? I mean, you ever have those moments where you're like, you're having a good spell in life and things are good and you say it and you're like, oh no, just gave myself the kiss of death. Because we always seem to know this, it, something's been too good too long. But you always have to be ready for an attack. And Nehemiah 4 says this, the Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. They will come. But from, from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. Do you understand this? They're building with a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. They're not giving up. See, many of us, what happens is when a battle comes our way and you've already begun to serve the Lord and serve in church and give to the church and put the church as a priority or God as a priority and a battle comes your way, you'll stop building to battle. But what Nehemiah taught him is we're going to battle while we build. Because what the devil wants to do is get your focus off of the real reason we're here. The real reason we're here is not to battle, it's to build. The real reason they were there was not to war, it was to wall. But they thought that the aggressive nature of the people coming after them took the focus off of them to build. And Nehemiah says, we're not stopping. And he goes on to say this, the leaders stationed themselves behind the, the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. And all the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Church, whatever requires work will always be worth it. Whatever requires work. I talked to a buddy of mine several months ago. He said, how are you doing as a church? I said, man, we're, we're growing. I said, but you know what? I want my own building right now. We set up every single Sunday morning. We have soul sisters. We tear down every single chair, put at tables. We have an, like we, we're sharing with other churches, and I just want our own place. And he goes, why? I said, wow, I'm going to jack you up. Why? I said, because I want my own place. He goes, nah, man, but this is where the culture's built. No, this is, this is where the church is the church. You get that building right now, we forget how to lock arms. We forget how to work. We forget what hard work looks like, and then you don't appreciate what you have. I come in every Sunday. We set up chairs. We take whatever we got to do. I'm like, yeah, we're building culture. We'll do what we got to do. If we don't have our, our own building for a while, that's okay. We're building 
culture. Because it's not about growth, it's about health. If we're healthy, it will grow. People that focus on growth get growth and the bottom falls out, but we're focusing on health. So when the growth comes, we can sustain it. But whatever requires work will always be worth it. And can I tell you right now, if you're getting attacked by the devil, good news. He knows that you're anointed. You know why? Because whoever's anointed always gets attacked. The anointed always gets attacked. The devil senses there's something spiritual about you, there's something powerful about you, and he will always come after you, which is why you always have to be ready for an attack. You know, uh, Teresa was, uh, when we met, she was a captain in the Air Force. She went to the Air Force Academy, and, and so when we met, Tr Teresa, her nickname is Captain Safety. Teresa always has been, always will be Captain Safety because Teresa always has a plan. When we got on the airplane to go on our honeymoon, Teresa goes, I need you to look uh, six seats forward, eight seats back. What? <laughs> six seats forward, eight seats back. What? Well, honey, I need you to understand, if the plane was to catch fire and be full of smoke. It's six seats forward to the exit. So if you can't see, you just touch seats. It's eight seats back. I said, baby, if there is flames on this plane and there is smoke, I'm counting how many seconds I have to kiss you goodbye. <laughs> Captain Safety. You, you know, I mean, been in ministry a long time when my kids were little. Before Christmas and Easter services at our church, because it was so big, Teresa would say, Everybody gather around, gather around. Now listen, kids, listen, listen. We need to have a plan. If there is a, a bomb threat, if there's a windstorm, if there's a fire, if there's a missile crisis, if there's an alien invasion, here's what we're going to do. We'll not be together, so you will come right out of kids' ministry. You will go right over there. You will scale that wall, and on the other side of that wall is a neighborhood. There's a yellow house right on the other side of that wall. I've driven by it on my way to work. It's right over that wall. You will come out of kids. You will climb that wall, and you will wait in the front yard, and your dad and I will meet you there. And my kids were like this. <laughs> and so... <laughs> They'd go to Easter services. Happy Easter, blatantly kids. <laughs> what? So, are you okay, Austin? <laughs> Teresa scared them to death, but we were always ready. If you ask Austin right now if something happened in this church, he would have a plan, I'm sure, with Teresa. They have a plan to go to Costco and meet up in the tire section. I, bear, I guarantee it. <laughs> ridiculous. But, but what I love is this. There's always a plan. You see, the problem with many of us is we don't have a plan. So when the devil attacks, guess what? You become reactive instead of being proactive. And the devil wants you to be reactive because when you're reactive, you don't respond well because you're all out of <sighs> instead of knowing exactly what to do. So you don't want to be reactive. You want to be proactive. Well, great, Sean. What does that mean? I want to be proactive. What does that mean? Well, good news that the Bible gave you the way to arm yourself in Ephesians chapter 6. The apostle Paul says, arm yourself with the full armor of God, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. Now here's what's incredible. Notice on the armor of God, there's nothing for your back. Do you know why? Because you never retreat from the devil, ever. You stand back to back with God's family and you fight together. You never retreat. Paul never said, and put on the back plate of fear. Why? Because I ain't running away, joker. Never flee from the devil. I mean, come on, I, 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 God's got me. I'm running away with power because I know what his power is, but I get the most powerful person on my side because I'm linked arms with somebody else. The battle's coming. And when you say, I'll build it, never lose focus. Too many of us lose focus on what's important. Nehemiah 4 says this, we worked early and late from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor our relatives, nor my servant, nor the guards who were there with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went to get water. 
they never stopped. Why? Because even if you can't, if, if, if you can't stay focused on what matters, the devil will always get you sidetracked on what doesn't. If you can't stay focused on what really matters, the devil will always get you sidetracked on what doesn't. He will get you focused on the petty when you should be focused on the purposeful. It'll happen every time it happens to me. You get focused on the little things that just don't matter. And you lose friends and you lose relationships and you lose because you just lose focus. We gotta stop and pull back and put everything in perspective of what truly really matters is what Nehemiah had to do to the people. So Sean, how do I stay focused? First thing is this, you have to resist rigorously. You gotta resist rigorously. Why do I say rigorously? Because you, you can't give up. Because the battle is coming. And, and, and here's what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to make you respond emotionally instead of logically. Because if you respond emotionally, it's based out of feel. But if you respond logically, it's based out of faith. What the devil wants to do in the midst of a crazy situation is make you react and respond. Anyone ever sent a text message and after you sent it, you thought, shouldn't have sent that. Anyone ever said something to a friend and as soon as it came out of your mouth, you're like, should have said that. Anyone ever said anything to a spouse and as soon as it came out, you're like, can't get that back. Because why? The devil wants you to respond emotionally and not logically. So how about instead of you and I reacting and responding, how about if before we do that, we pause and pray? Okay, before I send that, WWJD. Probably not. Because you know what happens when you pause and pray? The devil panics because you have the opportunity to actually think spiritually and think intentionally and not respond emotionally. So when that battle comes, you resist rigorously. The other thing you have to do when that battle comes, you gotta stand strong. First Corinthians 16 says this, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be, be strong. You gotta stand strong. You know what the devil wants to do? If he's confusing you, confusion makes you dizzy. Confusion makes you spin around. Confusion makes you lose sight of what's important. And if you're spinning around and you don't have stable footing, the devil makes you easy. It makes you easy for the devil to push you over. You ever seen those relays where you put your head on a bat and you spin around and then run? And the... And then they just, people just fall over by themselves. You know what the devil wants? The devil wants to confuse you and put you in a tailspin. That way he didn't have to touch you. You'll actually kill yourself. You got to stand strong. I'm not going to be confused by the ways of the devil. I know exactly what I'm called to do. Nehemiah says, I know exactly what we're doing. And I'm not letting anybody else confuse us in the midst of this panic. I'm going to actually stand strong. I'm going to resist and stand strong. And the other thing you have to do is you have to fight fearlessly. A lot of us, we fight fearfully, but you have to fight fearlessly. Why? Because you know who's on your side. You gotta fight, fight fearlessly. And the last thing is this, you gotta trust triumphantly. You've gotta trust triumphantly. Now, I didn't share this last week, but it's important to note that Nehemiah prayed about how to have a conversation with the king of Babylon before he went back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah had to have the king's approval, so he prayed for an open conversation with the king for months before he had the conversation with the king. And when he talked to the king, the king actually said, you can go to Jerusalem and build the wall, and I'll give you whatever you need to make it happen. The king actually sent with him men, horses, and chariots. So not only did Nehemiah go to build the wall, he went to build the wall with the full support of the king. So I truly believe when Sambalot and Tobias and all of these jokers were like just trying to bust on Nehemiah and the people to, for, because they want to build the wall, I guarantee you Nehemiah's like, <laughs> I got the backing of the king. Bring on whatever you want. But I guarantee you we're going to finish this wall 
Because I got the king on my side. And it changes your perspective when you have the king on your side. I, I, can't, I can't conquer this addiction. Uh, yes, you can because you get the king on your side. I, I can't beat this, this depression and this anxiety. Uh, you can because you have the king on your side. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do this. Oh, no, no, you can do this. The devil's trying to corrupt and confuse and tell you you can't, but you can because you've got the king on your side. And when you get the king on your side, it changes your perspective. Come on, stand to your feet. I was reading this story this week, and I thought, man, could you imagine years later when they were all sitting around those that built the wall talking about building the wall? And they were talking about, man, this guy Nehemiah shows up. And before he got here, man, no one did anything. And then Nehemiah shows up, we start building a wall, and then Sambalot and these guys start coming after us, and we were building a wall and fighting at the same time. We were sleeping in our clothes with a sword in our hand. And we continued to build the wall. And the Bible says that they built the wall around the city after it was completely crumbled in 52 days. 52 days. But I can't imagine the conversation. You know why? Because when you're in the middle of a God work, you can't see it. But when you look back, it all makes sense. Because right now, all you can see is the fight. But can I encourage you today, church? It's a fight worth fighting. Us building church together, it's a fight worth fighting. Will we go through our struggles? Absolutely. Will we go through our pain? Absolutely. Will we go through hard times? Absolutely. But will we endure and will we conquer? Absolutely. Because the king is on our side. Come on, bow your heads. Maybe you're here today. And maybe you're kind of wondering what this is all about. It's all about a wall, Sean. Nah. Nah. This whole thing's about a relationship with God. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you've never given your heart to Christ. That's where it all begins. Surrendering your heart to God. That's where it all begins. The Bible says when, when Jesus comes into your heart, he makes everything new. Your old life is gone. You have new life in Christ. And that's where it begins. Well, Sean, I want that today. I've never asked him for that. What do I have to do? There's a prayer that we pray that makes Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. He comes into your heart and he begins fixing all those holes and giving you a brand new heart. And the Bible says that when he comes into your life, he gives you a hope and a future. Your sins are forgiven. Your old life is gone. You have new life in Christ. And if you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ, but you want to, I'm going to count to three. On the count of three, I want you to be super bold and raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. One, two, three, just raise your hand. Yeah, raise it up high so I can see it. Yeah, awesome. Raise it up high so I can see it. Yeah. Awesome. We're all going to pray this prayer out loud together, but if you raised your hands, you just say it a little bit louder. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, today I give you my heart. I'm surrendering my life into your hands. So Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and make me brand new. And I want to follow you the rest of my life with everything I have. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Come on, Anchor. Let's celebrate all those that prayed that prayer today.